Anybody relate? <laughs> Have a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day? Or a series of them? Or several weeks of them? <laughs> right? In this story, Alexander, he's close to 12 years old. And those of us who have made a few more trips around the sun would look at Alexander and say, buckle up, buttercup. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> right? Life throws zingers at us. Life is full of horrible, terrible, very bad, no good days. Right. And, and living out this Christian faith, sometimes it feels like, God, are you, are you even listening? Are you, are you watching what I'm going through down here? Are you seeing this stuff that I'm, that's happening to me? I thought I was your kid. I thought you loved me. Yeah. You know it's going to be a bad day when you wake up face down on the pavement. Right? You see a 60 Minutes van uh, in your driveway when you get home from work. You know it's going to be a bad day when you call 911 and they put you on hold, right? Your birthday cake collapses from the weight of all the candles. That's a bad day. You turn on the news and they're showing emergency routes out of town. Right? Your car home goes off and remains stuck as you follow a group of Hell's Angels down the highway. That's going to be a bad day. Yeah. The bird singing outside your window is a buzzard. Yeah. Your boss tells you not to bother to take your coat off, a huh, page. <laughs> right? And you remember this poor guy? Remember that poor bird, the illustration I used some, some several months ago about the bird that got sucked up into a vacuum cleaner while its owner was trying to clean out its cage and accidentally sucked the bird into it and rescued the bird out of the dust covered with dust and then washed it under the sink and blew it with a hair dryer to dry it off. And the new, when, and when the, the uh, news reporter was talking to the owner, says, yeah, he doesn't sing too much anymore. He just kind of sits there and stares. <laughs> right? We can relate to poor Chippy. Damon and Paige Bass gave me the idea for this sermon. In a, the little over a year that they've been here with us, they've been part of our church family, um, I've seen them weather some pretty horrible, terrible, no good, very bad days. And I've asked them to come and share uh, their most recent story with us because it's just such a testament to how God takes us through those days that just seem like, Lord, really? Um, I need to take down some feedback there. I think that's coming through line two. So Paige and Damon, come on up here when you get a chance. morning everybody morning. Um, I'm Damon my wife Paige we've had a lot of no good very bad days in, in our time in 2003 I got really sick two different medical problems at once and I lost my job in my high-paying Silicon Valley job <clears throat> in the course of that in California if you don't have a job if you don't have income you're gonna be homeless real soon because things are very expensive there so about six months we lost everything we had Picked up and crashed back to Shreveport, my hometown. I was working hard when I could work. She was working full time, trying to rebuild our lives over the next 20 years. Lots of things happened along the way. We were forced to move without notice a couple of times through no fault of our own. Unless you saved up for something like that, it can be pretty devastating. I've had several major financial setbacks and endured bankruptcy. It takes a lot, a lot trying to get past the effects of having been homeless and broke for so long, but we were determined to pick ourselves up and improve our lot in life. Life's a great teacher. We went through it. <laughs> through our experiences, we started finding ways to improve the situation. With lots of prayer and careful choices, we began to land in better situations each time we fell. We began to refer to that as falling up. 
the landlord whose house we were living in at one point, we had to vacate suddenly, but we'd end up in a much better place because of it. A lot of tough work and, and digging to find the money to do that with, but we end up in a better situation. Our son totaled his car. We thought, that's it, we're sunk. Someone gave my son a car so he could finish college. He fell up. <laughs> COVID struck. Paige's company sent her home to do remote work, but as it turned out, her team performed way better at home than they did in the office. Their productivity skyrocketed. They got rewarded with being able to stay at home at work. They fell up. Around 2020, things went very sour with my family back in Louisiana, and effectively, I don't have a family in Louisiana anymore. That year, followed with the trouble with my son that a lot of people know about, that was the lowest point in my life, right before we found this church, the absolute low spot in my life. I was very depressed for about a year and a half. And one day I just I said, you know what? We're going to go to church. We're going to find some people. We're going to be happy again. And we did. So we took another leap of faith. No, I'm sorry, I skipped a step. We took another leap of faith. We left everything behind we had in Shreveport, took only what we could carry in a truck, and bought our first home here in Canyon City. We'd been renters bouncing from circumstance to circumstance all our lives. We finally grabbed life's by the horns and started living it and climbed the ladder. And we bought our first house here in Colorado and we've been giddily happy ever since. Two and a half years we've been here, we love this place. Um, we were lonely and isolated for some time, but one of my first customers, Miss Corlin, <laughs> invited me to her church's barbecue a year ago. Paige spotted her friend Kathy Maxson walking up to the church on the way here, and she just knew there's going to be great people here. I started yelling, Damon, Damon, it's Kathy, it's Kathy. I've heard about this church for a year. We're in the right place. We're in the right place. So um, we knew, we had, again, we fell up in a major way by landing here, and we knew it at the time. Um, thank God for First Baptist Church. Thank God for each one of you and your prayers along the way. Because now, it's Paige's turn to speak. If I can't do it, it's all written down. Mike so, close. thank you. On May 17th, my company eliminated my position. I had been there for 19 and a half years. At first, I was devastated, but... I also had this strange sense of relief, like, no matter what, it was going to be okay. Um, so I started a job search. And it seemed a little funny for me to want to do a very prayerful job search. How do you search LinkedIn and, and Indeed in prayer? Well, I found a way and I did it. A hundred and 83 job applications, so many rejections, so many rejections. And there was an opening for a local company that I was about 60% qualified for, and I thought, no, I can't apply for that. And this little voice in the back of my head said, do it, do it. Send them your resume, introduce yourself. Maybe they'll find a place for you. And so I had the phone call with this lovely HR lady, and we both knew and she said at one point well i have to be honest you're not one of the top applicants for this job but would you let me send your resume to some other managers because i think there are several places that would be perfect for you here and i said that would be a dream come true that would be an absolute dream come true so after that phone call i continued to put in applications and i just thought every day i just want to be where I'm supposed to be. And I had some interviews with a job at the Department of Corrections. The benefits are amazing. People speak so highly of the Department of Corrections and working for the state. And it was really, I was gonna be able to keep my house, which was my biggest worry. You know, we found this wonderful place. Are we gonna have to sell this house and move? But you know, I, just kept, I just kept going through the process. That local company called me back and said, you know, we have a couple of ideas for you. Would you, would you do an interview with us next week? It's, you're going to get on camera and you're going to do a presentation. I've never done anything like that before. Um, but I said, yes, absolutely. And I put my heart and soul into that presentation. 
and then a lot of days went by. Well, I got an offer from the Department of Corrections, and I knew that I was going to keep my house no matter what else happened. I was like, you know, it's not what I want. But if that's where I'm supposed to be, that's where I'm supposed to be. That job would have started August 1st, and we only have one car. So, and I would have needed to go every day to Colorado Springs for basic training, which I'm a little bit old for that, but I was going to do it. We have one car, and Damon would have trouble working, but we were going to figure it out. And in the meantime, I did my best to keep the faith and keep looking and keep asking, where am I supposed to go? What, what am I supposed to do? And then it happened. I got a call. I got a call from Estes Rockets. And she said, Paige, don't go to work for the DOC. I know you don't want to do that, and we don't want you to do that. We want you to come to work for us. Please come to work for us. Please don't work for the DOC. No one has ever begged me to take a job. No one has ever said, you have a place here with us, except for First Baptist. Mm. Mm. And I had a couple more jobs in the works. Monday or Tuesday of this coming week, I was probably going to be offered something in my old line of work, drowning in Excel files every day. It was a little more money, a little more possibility of growth. But when you ask me what I do, there is no simple answer. Well, now I can say I sell rockets. <laughs> I'm so excited and I'm so happy. I mean, yeah. the peace that came over me when I accepted that job is indescribable. Amen. Amen. And all I had to do was put in the work and keep the faith. Amen. Praise God. Wow. Praise she starts God. tomorrow morning. Oh, yeah. Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. <laughs> Thank you all so much. We feel so blessed Amen. to be here. Amen. I'll let you put that back. Amen. Isn't that a great story? And in, in, in the, it's the, the victory at the end, the celebration, it, it, it's made more, all the more awesome when you've watched the journey. And for weeks, Paige and, and Damon, you know, they just, okay, we're trusting God. We're trusting God. And I remember talking to them one time, and, and telling and saying, just trying to encourage him. He says, you know, we, we made a decision a long time ago. We don't fall down anymore. We fall up. And I thought, that'll preach. That'll preach. That attitude of when life throws you horrible, terrible, no good, very bad days, the attitude of I trust the Lord makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? So what do we do? with very bad days. I'm going to move through my message pretty quickly. What do we do with these things? And that's exactly the question that the Christians that, that James wrote his letter to were asking. You know, they had been scattered to the four winds of Asia and Europe. Now this is the church that was primarily located in Jerusalem and the, 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 the Jewish war was beginning to break out with the Romans and just all Hades broke loose in Jerusalem and these Christians were being horribly persecuted and they were scattered and they went to the four winds and James is writing to them and he calls them the, the dispersed ones, the ones who have been exiled, is how he describes them. You know, they had been hated for being Jews. They had been hated for being Christians. They were ostracized from their culture, their shops, Everything had been boycotted. Their families were harassed in the marketplace and in schools and in the public arenas. The Jewish revolt, as I mentioned, was just happening. And this bunch that got scattered to the four winds, their ex-pastor writes a letter to them calling himself a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how the book of James opens up. The book of James is kind of like a memo that's sent to the scattered flock after the word came back to him concerning the problems they were facing. The horrible lives that they were apparently experiencing while they were in exile. And, and they were returning, resulting rather in questions about how all this suffering, all this stuff fit into God's scheme of things. Yeah. 
Because sometimes it just seems like what I'm going through doesn't line up with how I understand my life is supposed to be in Christ sometimes, right? We've all been there. And so James starts his, 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 his letter in, in uh, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. He says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now, James isn't talking about the self-made or sin-made messes that sometimes people create in their lives. He's talking about those trials that come upon you through no fault of your own, that come out of the blue, the loss of a job, you know, conflict with, with, with family that, that doesn't want anything to do with you anymore, and they don't give you any explanations why. You know, health issues. I mean, we, there's a whole list of things we could, we could come up with to describe those trials that are like, Lord, where's this coming from? These are the trials and struggles that God allows, things you didn't bring on yourself, but were foisted upon you by outside forces, and they're beyond your power to control. You can't fix them. Yeah, you didn't cause it, but you can't fix it either. That's frustrating, isn't it? When you find yourselves in those, in those circumstances. It's frustrating. But James says, consider it pure joy. God's going to use this event in your life for his glory. In verse 3, the word testing doesn't, doesn't mean to make someone fail. It's Because when you read that, count it all because God tests our faith. And, and, and if we're not careful, we could get the picture of, of God just heaping it on us, trying to find our breaking point. Where's the point where I can make him scream uncle? You know? And that's not the, an accurate picture of what God's doing. He's allowing life to test us. He's allowing the trials to come in so that our faith can be proven. Proven in the sense of not proving it necessarily to God. He knows us but to ourselves and to those around us. You know, it's not showing something to God. It's showing, it, it's showing to ourselves how, how, what our walk is like in God. How well do we trust Him? Where do we need to grow, maybe? And to others, to show them what we're made of. And when we go through those tests and come out victorious on the other side, who gets the glory? Jesus does. The story that Paige and Damon told this morning was made all the more awesome because you could see God's hand in it. God directed their steps and made, the, and, and made a way for them. Many of you have stories like those, right? God gets the glory when we endure the testing life throws at us. God gets the glory for that. James goes on to say, the testing of your faith produces perseverance. It's like the inspected by stickers. When, we get a, when, you, when you buy something in, uh, the, of, of quality, sometimes it'll say inspected by a, a name or a number of the person who actually looked at that object that you purchased and said, yes, this, this meets the muster. This, this meets the standards of what our company produces in its products. Yeah. That's kind of what we get out of that with the Lord. Inspected by God passes and it passed the muster it's proven to be the real thing James tells us that there are many kinds of trials you know, this can go from getting gum in your hair like poor little Alexander did to losing a job to saying goodbye to a loved one to being abandoned by a spouse or close friend every human trial is an opportunity for us to allow God to work something deeper in us if, and there's the, there's, the, there's the caveat, if we will submit ourselves to his process, if we'll trust him, you know. Terrible, horrible, no good, very bad days are guaranteed. Jesus said that. In this world, you're going to experience tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And through him, we overcome as well. And how we respond to those days shows ourselves and others what we're really made of. Yeah. So what do those tests do for us? The testing of your faith produces perseverance, James says. 
And he goes on to say, let perseverance finish its work. This is an interesting phrase. So it, it's, it, when we get through, a, when we get through a, a circumstance or we're going through a circumstance, the perseverance doesn't happen at the end. It's part of the process. We persevere as we go through the process. And at the end, at some point, perseverance has worked it's compl- it's, it, has, it has completed its work. And what is the result of that work? So, so that you may be mature, complete, and not lacking anything. I want that in my Christian walk, don't you? I want to be a mature follower of Christ. Not, not like babies, Paul said in, in, in Ephesians chapter 4. Don't be like little babies tossed around by the wind and the waves, by every, every little doctrine that comes along, by life itself. Not to be that, but to be, to be mature, to be able to stand in the Lord. And yeah, this is a, a terrible, horrible, very bad, no good day. But you know what? Jesus is walking through it with me. I am not alone. To be mature, complete, not lacking anything. Wouldn't you like to get to a place in your walk with God where you're not lacking anything? What is, you know, that, that, that you're able to, to walk out your faith in a place of peace and serenity in spite of the storm around you? We're not talking about the absence of those, those storms. They're going to be there. But to be able to, to go through them with the assurance that my hand is in God's and he's got, um, and I have his hand, I'm not alone. This is, I'm, I'm headed towards a victory. I can't see it yet, but it's there. God's got my life in his hands. So the, these tests, what do they do for us? One, they make us strong. The word perseverance is an interesting word, hypomene in the Greek, and it literally means to stand under, and it's a term used to describe a weightlifter who is holding the barbells up above his head. Right? That's what endurance means. Now, have you ever lifted weights before? I did once. <laughs> once. <laughs> no, years ago, I decided I was going to try to do that. And I had some friends that were into the whole bodybuilding thing. They were, and so I went to the gym with them. And the first thing they did is they had me lay on my back, and I was going to do some bench presses. It was so humiliating. I could only pen, press the bar, no weights on it. You know, I, I weighed 132 pounds at the time. I used to be real skinny. And there was no muscle there. And I was just like, I'm not doing this. Nobody laughed. There was no, no, no guilt, no condemnation, no snickers, because everybody starts somewhere. You know, but over the months, all of a sudden, weight is being added to that barbell. And I'm able to endure, to stand under, more weight than I was before. That's what perseverance does. Let perseverance have its perfect work in you so that you may be strong, complete, perfect, lacking nothing. That's how it works. And too often we, when we hit the trials, we run from them. Rather than saying, okay, God, get me through this. Yeah. And we try to fix things on our own, only to make a bigger mess. Right? Yeah. So just to stand under these things. They help us grow. Let perseverance finish its work. You know, one trip to the gym is not going to transform you. It won't do it. And I believe that, that, first, that first night that I went and lifted weights and, and had that humiliating experience, I was thinking, I'm done. This is it. I don't want to do this. One, it hurt. I couldn't believe how bad I hurt the next day from just pressing the bar. I mean, it was an, an, an Olympic set. I mean, the, the, it was a, the bar itself had some significant weight to it. But I was, I was hurting. My body hurt all over. It's like, I didn't sign up for this. I thought this was supposed to make things better. And it didn't. But over time, again, it's that constant, uh, it's that constant perseverance standing under that gets us through and brings us to the end where there's victory. If we continue to persevere, 
when we're facing the different challenges that life throws at us, when we continue to persevere, we will grow, mature, and be complete, not lacking anything. So let's fall up, not down. You know, page, page your, and, and Damon, your testimony was beautiful today. Thank you. That was so good. And it was weeks, wasn't it? It was weeks going just of, 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 and that hard work and the uncertainty and the not knowing, but God's perseverance, his perseverance, your perseverance in the Lord, rather, got you through it. And he brought you to a better place, something better. Isn't that cool? Trust God's intentions. Do we, do we, do we trust God? And that's another thing that comes out of these trials. Trust his intentions. We read this this morning as our call to worship. The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. This is his promise to you. Though he may stumble, he will not fall. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Though you stumble, he's not going to let you fall. He's upholding you with his hand. Give no place for fear. Don't let fear become part of the equation. You've got to fight it. Because we can't just say it's not there. There are times I'm, I'm afraid and concerned. and Okay, Lord, this is what I'm feeling. But here's what Psalm 118, verse 6 says. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? What's the worst thing that this life can do to me? Nothing. Because in God's economy, yeah, in God's economy, I win. Acknowledge your weakness and your need for God's strength. Just like Paul, when he was dealing with that thorn in the, that, that thorn in the flesh that he had, and it was something that, that was weakening him, the Lord said to Paul, Paul, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. It's okay to be weak. It's okay to feel weak. We need to just acknowledge that, say, Lord, I can't do this. There is nothing in me that can get me through this thing, so I have to lean on you. And he says, great, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Watch what I do in your behalf. And finally, don't give up. Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in, go in doing good. At the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. Now, did you catch the if in there? Yeah. As a runner running for the prize and running a race, and you get to real close to the end and you just get tired and say, I'm done, and walk off the... the, the the, the racetrack, and you're 10 feet away from the, the finish line, you don't win. You, all that work for nothing got you that far and you quit. Don't give up. Because in due time, we will reap a harvest. God said this, not me. If we don't give up. Hang in there. Endure. Amen? Can we do that? Let's do that as, as God's people. Let's endure. Lord Jesus... We thank you, God, for this promise. We thank you for your word that encourages us to trust you in the midst of all the things that life throws at us. God, may we as your people walk in strength. May we walk, God, in your victory. Lord, may we walk in a deepening awareness of your working in our life. We thank you, Father, for the, the great story we heard from Damon and Paige this morning. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.